Welcome to Have You Heard with Heather Darling. I'm Heather Darling and today's guest is retired Milwaukee County Sheriff David Clark. Sheriff Clark holds a bachelor's in criminal justice and management from Concordia University, graduating summa cum laude. He holds a master's degree in domestic security from the U.S. Naval Academy Center for Homeland Defense and Security. And he brings to the show today 40 years of law enforcement service, including 24 years of service with the City of Milwaukee Police Department, becoming command level officer there. And next, he holds 15 years of experience as the Sheriff of Milwaukee County, having been elected four times to that office. Sheriff Clark is now the president of a statewide Milwaukee organization, which is called Rise Up Wisconsin. Welcome back to the show, Sheriff. My pleasure. Uh, last week, we saw in New York City a man named Jordan Neely with known mental health issues, uh, throwing garbage and uh, other things at passengers on a subway and screaming that he wasn't afraid of prison, uh, he wasn't afraid to be put to death. And uh, he was put in a chokehold by a Marine veteran who seemed to be looking out for himself and the security of other passengers. What does it say when people have to start taking the law into their own hands because police aren't there to keep them safe? Well, it tells me a number of things. First of all, it tells me that people have lost faith in government's ability to keep them safe, to protect their public spaces, like a subway ride and they're not going to wait around any longer you know trying to call 911 in that situation is just not going to help on a moving train moving subway system you know anybody who's been on the uh, the new york subway or any of the other subways in the united states and i have been been on the one in dc the one on san francisco the bay area rapid transit these things can be frightening and intimidating experiences for many users of that system and for many people it's their only means of transportation, so they don't have any other recourse. And they have to sit up there full of anxiety. Imagine this, every day, whether you're going to work, going to school, or for any other reason, you dread taking that escalator down underneath ground for your ride to and from uh, work, and you have to do that twice a day. It's not fun. So I would ask too, you know, where are the transit police? Uh, they need to develop a sense of omnipresence, not to stand on the platform and need to ride those trains. And, and I don't see that happening all that often. What about the fact that Neely had 42 prior arrests um, on charges, including three unprovoked assaults on women in the subway system between 2019 and 2021, and the system turned him loose time and time again without doing anything about his mental health situation or his homelessness situation. What does that say about government? Failed. That's what it tells me. Failed government. Um, you know, 42 times, 44 times in and out of jail, no real long period of, of, of incarceration sent the signal to him, uh, this Neely character, that uh, people were not going to uh, punish him adequately for his unwanted behavior. Now you can look at the mental health aspect, but I I think too often that that's the low hanging fruit. It's the thing that we want to jump to first. You know, the 99% of the people in this country who suffer from some sort of mental illness, they wouldn't do this and they wouldn't behave this way in public spaces. So government doesn't know what to do. So they just put him back out there you can't institutionalize them. I think that Supreme Court case, I think it was determined in 73, but don't hold me to the year, where the Supreme Court ruled that you cannot hold uh, people against their will in mental health institutions just because they suffer from mental health. There was no um, solution for that in terms of what are we gonna do then? How are we gonna do things? You know, you put a guy on medication, a woman on medication, and maybe they're okay while they're on the medication, but there's no way of ensuring that they stay on it. So there's not a lot of answers as to what to do uh, with these people suffering from mental health, but you cannot allow them to overwhelm public spaces, to live in the streets, to live in the subway system. I don't have all the answers for that, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's the problem of the city elected officials and the policymakers as to what they're going to do to 
um, not make these public spaces be overwhelmed by people with all sorts of problems. So in the news we've seen over the last few days since this event happened, a lot of protests, people calling for the arrest of the Marine veteran and charges against the Marine veteran who was involved. Do you think that there would have been or could have been a different outcome for Neely had these same people gone out and protested against the fact that this guy was turned loose by the system time and again and demanded that answer that we don't have from government officials as to how to solve this problem? Yeah, but that's not what they're after. Look, these are rabble rousers. These aren't protesters. These are are instigators. They're agitators, for heaven's sakes. They're on a political mission. They have a political agenda, agenda, and it's not to help people. It's not to help society. It's to create chaos. That's what they specialize in. Uh, it's a reflective action by these individuals that when something like this happens, the first thing they do is take to the streets. They don't have all the information. They don't care that they have the information. What they're trying to do is prime the public with a narrative, some sort of slogan, uh, you know, justice for Jordan Neely, you know, stuff like that. That's not going to help anything. I think, unfortunately, for the uh, Marine veteran in this case, you know, this thing is going to be reviewed by Alvin Bragg's office. You know, he's a political, uh, politically active. He's an activist is what he is. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen, but from what I know, and I don't have all the facts, I, I made that clear in the time I started talking about this, uh, but you could piece some things together. With my 40 years in law enforcement, having investigated these types of things, I bring that to the table that these loud mouths, these blowhards do not bring. And when I looked at uh, what has been released and you look at the law, uh, this is nothing more than an accidental death. This Marine veteran, veteran was trying to restrain him, not kill him. He didn't intend to kill him, for heaven's sakes. And, you know, the manner of death, which is determined by the coroner or the medical examiner, I don't get all wigged out about that because he ruled it a homicide. There's only a couple classifications in terms of manner of death that he can determine. It's either homicide, suicide, could be um, undetermined. And there's a fourth one that, that obeys me right now, but... Just because some, uh, a death is ruled a homicide does not in and of itself mean that somebody is criminally liable for it. So then we look at the cause of death. That's the manner of death I talked about. Uh, you know, there's things like gunshot wound, there's stabbing, there's overdose, and there's any other, uh, any other number of causes of the death, not the manner. I'm going to keep these things uh, separate. And the cause of death here could be accidental, and that's exactly what this was. Uh, on April 29th in Manhattan also, uh, there was an individual named Michael Rowe. He got into a verbal altercation with another gentleman. He pulled out a weapon and began firing on a crowded New York City sidewalk. The charges that were filed against him were possession of ammunition by a convicted felon. But from what I can see, there were no actual gun charges that were filed. So we can only imagine that this may have been an illegal gun. Why were there no gun charges filed by an individual who clearly was a convicted felon in possession of not only ammunition, but also a handgun? I don't know. I don't have any of the facts, uh, any of the facts at all regarding that case. But when you start charging people with uh, ammunition, a lot of times that could be a federal charge versus the gun. Could be a federal if it's felon in possession of a firearm, but more times or not, they, they leave that at the state level. And without having all the facts, it's kind of hard for me to determine why they only charge them with the uh, ammunition charge. Chicago, mid-April, hundreds of kids ran amok in the streets. The police can't do anything other than stand in the way. If they, if they so much as touch one of these kids, they're going to be in more trouble than the kid was. They, they were assaulting tourists, they were damaging vehicles, they were damaging stores and other properties. When is sanity restored to our system and how? Well, you know, first of all, in the city of Chicago, that's another failed city, <laughs> excuse me, with uh, questionable urban public policy. State of Illinois recently uh, enacted a no bail law starting last January 1st. You take that along with decriminalizing certain behavior, dropping classes of, of crime from felony to misdemeanor, you're going soft. What you're doing is you're sending uh, a message to the criminal element that, again, 
We're going to tolerate your behavior. We're going to find excuses. And we're not going to hold you accountable. We're not going to punish you for that unwanted behavior. Now, you saw that incident. I watched the video. Uh, it's totally out of control. And what has happened in the city of Chicago because of this war on police, they have surrendered public spaces to the criminal element. The criminal element controls the streets, many of these public spaces, and it isn't just in, in the city of Chicago, but that's the one we're talking about here. You're right, the cops, I saw them in the video just standing there, and this is no knock on them. Uh, this is what happens when you um, defund the police. This is what happens when you um, neuter the police. You don't give them you know, the, the tools and the authority and the public support they need to reclaim these public spaces. And once you surrender them to the criminal element, you know what? Good people aren't going down there anymore. You see a lot of businesses on Magnificent Mile. I've been down, down there oftentimes. It's their, uh, uh, it's a high-end retail uh, area, but you know, one third of the stores are closed. It's boarded up. It's ugly down there now. Businesses cannot uh, survive in that sort of climate. And so you're gonna see a, you know, a slow death that's going to uh, happen to the city of Chicago once the business community says, we're done with this, we're out of here. Sheriff, we're already at that point in the show where we have to take a quick commercial break. So everybody stay tuned. We'll be back with more Have You Heard and today's guest, Sheriff David Clark. What makes a Wawa Club? Is it the crispy bacon on the turkey BLT? The endless layers of flavor of the buffalo chicken salad? Or is it a secret handshake? Nah. At Wawa, there's a club for everyone. Find yours today. We ride for those who died. The Police Unity Tour and RVN Television is bringing to you a show called On Your Honor, Straight Talk. And I'm your host, Patrick Monturi. I am a retired police chief from Florham Park, New Jersey. And I am also retired from the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in Washington, D.C. I am currently, for the last 27 years, the CEO and founder of the Police Unity Tour. And this show will bring to you straight talk about law enforcement, the actions and heroism that is provided to you, the citizens of the United States, as well as their actions in falling in the line of duty as we could see some of the stories that surround that. Again, please watch us on RVN Television and be safe, take care. At Jersey Mike's, they slice your order fresh, right in front of you. And let me tell you, watching that can send a rush of emotions through a person. Excitement, impatience, baby-like wonder, indecisive, anticipatory chewing, nervous pacing, happy claps, and finally, jealousy, because that's this guy's sub. I should order one. Mm, good idea. Sliced right in front of you. It's a Jersey Mike's thing. A sub above. Welcome back to Have You Heard with Heather Darling and today's guest, Sheriff David Clark. David, when we went to break, I had asked you a question about the um, youth in Chicago that sort of ran amok a couple of weeks ago. Um, this morning, as of this morning, the Chicago Sun-Times reflected 173 murders occurring so far in 2023 in that city. And they seem to be keeping a running tally. With each name is, or with each event is listed the name of the victim, if it's known, their age, if known, the location of the killing, as well as the victim's race, if they are black. Has the victim's race always been such a prevalent issue? Well, it, it, it depends on what you mean by that. Uh, because what it tells me is you know there's a disparate impact in terms of victims of these violent crimes they're predominantly black so i'm glad they're pointing that out because it does matter in this case uh you know blacks represent 13 percent of the u.s population yet they're like 60 percent of violent crime victims all right uh there's a lot of black on black crime these are conversations that have to go on within the black community in terms of, you know, not finding anything culturally redeeming about some of the lifestyles of, of, of people in the city of Chicago, especially young people. 
there are um, a rising number of young people that are the suspects and you know identified as a suspect or an arrest in these uh, these violent crimes that are happening. So those are the elements I think that need to be needs to, the black community needs to have a conversation among itself that we're not going to tolerate this nonsense anymore. We're not going to find anything culturally redeemable uh, by the way you act and behave. In, in public spaces and certain lifestyle uh, choices. Like I said, a lot of these kids are growing up with no effective parenting, no parent involved at all. There's school failure, there's joining gangs, there's using drugs and alcohol. And, you know, when you bring this up, oftentimes the agitators, want, they, just, they want to talk about it in terms of racism. And nothing to do with racism. The blacks are killing themselves for heaven's sake. So um, I think it starts with a, a general conversation within the black community. And then from there, it can spring out and it can direct policymakers and elected officials. Look, here's what we want. Here's what we're looking for in terms of our neighborhoods and our schools. And then, you know, hold these elected officials accountable for, um, you know, more effective strategies for heaven's sakes to try to, you know, keep a lid on this stuff. Sheriff, uh, this past weekend, eight individuals were killed by an individual named Mauricio Garcia in Allen, Texas, before the gunman was killed by a police officer. Garcia was removed from the Army for known mental health issues in the past. And I understand that we did, in, in reference to Neely, talk a little bit about um, mental health and its role in this violence that we see. But we seem to continue to see violence with a narrative relating to mental health. How does the system continue to miss these individuals? I don't think they miss them. I, they don't know what to do. And, and you know, therein lies the problem. Because like I said, once the Supreme Court determined you can't hold somebody against their will just for being uh, mentally ill, you know, many of these people need to be institutionalized, but I don't know how you're going to get back to that in light of the Supreme Court ruling, which is why I said we probably need to revisit this case, have the Supreme Court take it up again, losing all this data that, hey, this isn't working. There are certain people, not all of them, you don't mass warehouse everybody with uh, suffering from mental illness, but there are some that these clinicians and these experts should easily be able to identify and go, this person's not going to stay on their meds. This person is a danger and a nuisance to society. And they need to be held in a, um, a locked, you know, mental, mental ward or mental hospital like we used to do. But until, until that happens, like I said, I don't have the answer for that, but it's not for me to come up with because I'm not the uh, policymaker in these cities. I'm not the, I'm no longer the law enforcement executive, but it's not a law enforcement issue anyway. Uh, but until somebody decides, hey, we're going to sit down, we're going to sort through this, and we're going to come up with a workable uh, remedy to, to deal with these individuals, and before they go off like they do, then you're going to continue to see it happen. Sheriff, our criminal justice system has, until recently, seemingly been based on punishment for crime, including loss of freedom, uh, some, some rights, and... Uh, other deterrents. What happens when you remove these punishments and deterrents from in front of would-be criminals? You see the behavior repeated. It's a simple model. You want to reward behaviors that you want to see more of and you want to punish behaviors you want to see less of for heaven's sakes, but we got it twisted. And when somebody gets arrested for, for some sort of uh, uh, criminal behavior, and they're given, you know, the, under this second chance, job training, uh, you know, schooling and stuff like that. You're rewarding that behavior. I'm not suggesting that at some point after a reasonable amount of, of, of time being separated from society, I'm not suggesting that some of these other interventions wouldn't help. But we're doing this on a mass scale. It doesn't work for everybody. If the person has, has been like the person we talked about at the beginning 42 times, he gets arrested a 43rd time, you can't say, hey, if we just do this, this thing will, will rectify itself because it won't. So punishment does play a, a, its rightful role in corrections. I know there are other avenues with which a prosecutor can deal with these individuals once they're in the system through an arrest. 
But it's got to be based on not just a social engineering experiment to think that everybody who gets job training will go out and find a job and be a productive citizen. That's just not how human behavior works. So until these individuals who make these, uh, these decisions have a realistic view of human behavior, then they're going to continue to uh, let these people slip through the uh, slip through the bar, so to speak, through the net. Flagship stores in major cities for a lot of companies that supported very liberal criminal justice justice policies seem to be controlled more by ESG now than profits and shareholder interest. So now that they're closing, do you see a, a restoration to sanity in, in their case, or do you think that ESG has gone so far in controlling corporations that they'd rather see stores close, flagship stores closed, than go back to their old way of doing business? Well, yeah, that's, a, <laughs> that's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, sometimes once they go down that rabbit hole, they're afraid to reverse course. They're afraid that the mob out there uh, that's just waiting will turn on them. You know, and, but it's just a matter of time before business, you, know, you can't continue to bleed red ink quarter after quarter after quarter. And you got shareholders to report to. And you can't just keep coming to these shareholder meetings saying, well, another quarter that we lost money, you know, based on some of, maybe it's based on some of what we're doing here. And then eventually, you know, they'll go belly up. But I don't know, you would think this stuff would turn on a dime, but it really doesn't. Uh, Sheriff, what role do you believe that our open borders play in uh, our increased criminal rates? Uh, significant. Uh, I think it plays a significant role. Um, you know, we don't really know who we're letting into our country. We don't have good vetting down at the border. I don't care what my orcas and all these other people uh, at Homeland Security, they're, they're not effectively vetting these individuals. It's been shown that uh, gang members have gotten in MS-13, for instance. The cartel controls the, the Mexican side of the southern border. And, you know, it's where the drugs are flowing in, the sex trafficking, so on and so forth. Um, but you can't, you, you have to have effective vetting because you have to know who you're letting into your country. And even some of these individuals who have been deported before are back again, which tells me the border's not sealed. Trump wanted a wall. Biden has open borders. What role do you think the border will play, immigration will play, in our 2024 presidential election? I don't know. I thought it would have played a, a, more of a significant role in the midterms of 2022, and it didn't. Uh, I don't know where the disconnect is. Um, Many times people are single issue voters and if you don't live in a border state, it doesn't really impact you even though those individuals coming into the border are spread, filtering throughout the United States. But, um, you know, unless the stuff is, is happening to you on a daily basis, it's hard to uh, get everybody else throughout the country to understand the impact of it. Um, I, I don't understand why people made that that decision in, in 2020 to reverse course on some of the policies of the Trump administration. I understand the politics of it. Uh, the left and the media demonized him. Uh, but at the same time, you couldn't argue with the success. The economy was humming along. The border, uh, we had better border enforcement. The border was somewhat sealed. You had, United States was energy independent and Trump ran on all that in 2020, and the people, the American people, in large numbers, decided they wanted to go a different way, so here we are. I don't know if um, uh, these things will come back to haunt, uh, or, or I shouldn't say that. I should say that they, I don't know that these will change people's minds, because I would have thought they would have happened in 2022, and it didn't. Sheriff, as always, we're out of time before I'm out of questions, but I have one last question for you before we wrap it up for today, and that is you have a new podcast. So for our viewers who want to watch, what is the name of your podcast and where can they find it? It's called Straight Talk with America's Sheriff David Clark. That would be me. 
Uh, a new one comes out every week, usually on Tuesday. So one came, a new one came out this morning, and I take some of these uh, issues that are germane to to everybody really, and I drill down inside of them. I don't just repeat talking points. I don't repeat narratives. Um, you know, I don't you know bring up a topic and say how horrible it is that you know there's a mass shooting. We all know that. But I drill down inside. I usually find an avenue or a route that not many people have talked about in terms of the event. So you'll find uh, some interesting just observations, my observations based on my uh, my experience. So it's again, straight talk. And it can be found on any major platform, uh, podcast platform. It's on 20 of them, Spotify, YouTube. Uh, just put it in a search engine, straight talk podcast with David Clark, and it'll lead you to Rumble. It's on Rumble. Uh, so it's out there, but I need people to go there to, to find uh, me and my take on these things, which is a little different than a lot of other people. Sheriff, as always, I appreciate your being on the show. I know our viewers appreciate hearing from you. Uh, we always get a very uh, no-holds-barred perspective, and, and you do drill down in different, a in different avenues than other people. So um, thank you for coming on the show today. It's always my pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you next week for another episode of Have You Heard with Heather Darling.